Greetings and welcome. We are in sophomore English, and uh, our our lecture for this afternoon is difficult to title for those of you who are working now on a sheet of paper and notes. I suppose that we could be talking about issues of power and the dynamics of power, and I might even get to a little Noam Chomsky before the end of the lecture, we will see. But the place I'm actually going to begin is with the great Eli Weissel on page 860 of your, uh, of your hymnals and his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize. This is, of course, a very famous speech and one that we want to now address together. Take a look at what Eli Weissel will have to say. I think these words merit our hearing them aloud. They are quite important words uh, for the not only 20th century, but obviously the 21st century. It's with a profound sense of humility that I accept the honor you've chosen to bestow upon me I know your choice transcends me. This both frightens and pleases me. It frightens me because I wonder, do I have the right to represent the multitudes who have perished? Do I have the right to accept this great honor on their behalf? I, I do not. That would be presumptuous. No one may speak for the dead. No one may interpret their mutilated dreams and visions. It pleases me because I may say that this honor belongs to all the survivors and their children and through us to the Jewish people with whose destiny I have always identified. I remember it happened yesterday or eternities ago. A young Jewish boy discovered the kingdom of night. I remember his bewilderment. I remember his anguish. It all happened so fast. The ghetto, the deportation, the sealed cattle car, the fiery altar upon which the history of our people and the future of mankind were meant to be sacrificed. I remember, he asked his father, can this be true? This is the 20th century, not the Middle Ages. We would allow such crimes, who would allow such crimes to be committed? How could the world remain silent? And now the boy is turning to me. Tell me, he asks, what have you done with my future? What have you done with your life? And I tell him that I've tried, that I've tried to keep memory alive, that I've tried to fight those who would forget. Because if we forget, we are guilty and we are accomplices. And then I explain to him how naive we were, that the world did know and remained silent. And that is why I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Now, let's turn and ask what I think is a relatively easy question to ask but a difficult question to answer. I'll ask it in the most plebeian of language to begin. How do you explain bullies? I said I would ask it in a plebeian way first. How do you explain bullies? I'll ask it in terms of Eli Weissel's language. How do you explain concentration camps? How do you explain Nazi concentration camps where over 8 million people are exterminated in a process of not so many years, not so many days even. I'll continue. How do you explain the fact that we have now engaged in a reading where American citizens were rounded up and were taken to special internment camps not to be exterminated, but to be withheld from the greater American population during the Second World War because their ethnicity was Japanese. How do you explain this? How do you explain the fact that in 1994, in 100 days, a million Rwandans kill each other? Do the mathematics on that one. How do you account for that? 10,000 people a day slaughtered in 100 days. 
And the world kind of knows this stuff, as Eli Weissel will point out, and remained silent. How do you account for this? That's the first question. The second question, what, what do you do as a high school sophomore in the face of this kind of revelation? I've had sophomores who say, you know, I guess I knew that because I did some worksheet in eighth grade history about it, but it never really occurred to me, man, that's a lot of people in a short period of time. But like, dude, what do you want me to do about it? I'm a high school sophomore living in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming. What, what am I supposed to do about the fact that there is all of this death, this carnage, other than to get really darkly pessimistic and to say, well, it just sucks to be them, I guess. I, I have a sense of, that's not uh, much of an answer. Like, what am I supposed to do about it? A an extension question. What do any of these readings have to say that we're working through? What do any of these readings have to say that can somehow begin to kind of help us have an answer to these two questions of how do you explain the fact that humans do this to other humans? And then what is it that can be a, a legitimate response? Back to Weissel just before we leave him. Notice what he says at the end of his very brief acceptance speech. It was very controversial then. It's still a very controversial observation. Did you see what he said? We are guilty if we forget. If we allow for ourselves to somehow forget the atrocities of the past, we are guilty in some way in our silence. Now that is a pretty remarkable thing to say. Uh, to what degree do you feel guilty for any number of atrocities of the past? We obviously live in the West where, for example, a wounded knee comes to mind immediately for us, doesn't it? The fact that on this very land, there were people who lived here before we arrived. They kind of liked living here. And then they weren't allowed to live here anymore. To what degree can I respond to that as a high school sophomore? I mean, what do I say? How do, how do I make any sense of it, the past? And how do I make any kind of hopeful observations about the future? Let's begin by asking a simple question. Is it true that there has been this level of insanity, violence, etc., uh, in the history of the world? And they, obviously it's a rhetorical question, right? Obviously the answer is, yeah, yeah. It's... Second question, what kinds of classical observations have been made in regards to this issue? Now let's go to the philosophers. And this is where we will begin now to maybe take a few notes. One way to talk about this topic, and uh, I know that we've shared some of this already with you before, but we'll do it again. One way to talk about this topic is to ask about humans and their what we call nature. Okay, and uh, this view says, look, when you look at human beings, you inherently kind of have a sense that they have a certain way about them. When you look at humans, one way to talk about humans is that they're inherently bad or evil or to some degree fallen. They're nasty. Uh, one of the greatest instantiations of this is the great philosopher Hobbes, H-O-B-B-E-S, who will say in his classic text, Leviathan, each of us considers every other person our potential assassin. Whoa, now that's an extreme position. Think about what he just said. I look at you, you look at me. Buried deep in our psyche is tremendous fear about the other person because we realize you could kill me and I could kill you. But that's just the way it is because that's the way we're hardwired. That's just the way it is. We're nasty, we're violent, we're mean, and that's just the way it is. And to think otherwise is kind of silly because that could put you in a position where, well, the word Eli Weissel uses is naive. We were, he says back then, naive. That is to say, we didn't really understand human nature very well. And because we didn't understand human nature very well, terrible things happen. Now that's one view. A second view says, look, humans are inherently pretty good, but we become corrupted in some ways because of society, and more particularly by a poor or a bad education. This is kind of the typical liberal answer to the question of the Holocaust. How do you explain the Holocaust? Dude, I mean, all these people, like, how do you explain that fact? And the answer is, well, it's not that those SS guards were necessarily really vicious, bad men. 
predominantly men, some women? The answer is rather, they were poorly educated. They were given an education which did not serve them well. And because it didn't serve them well, they, they did terrible things. Eli Weissel will to some degree play the same game when he says, I wrote the novel Night as an autobiographic text to try to share with people what really happened at Auschwitz. I tried to make it as real as I could. Some of you will say about that novel, it's very difficult to read a novel like that because the portrayals of the violence are so graphic that it's like, dude, if they were making this into a movie, that would not be something I would even want to watch because it would be so horrific. And yet Weissel will argue, the reasoning is simple. I want to try to, see, we're back to our word, I want to try to provide a proper education. In other words, when you talk about bullies and being mean, maybe you can help bullies not be bullies. Okay. So now we are met then with kind of a classical dichotomy. On the one hand, we can look at human beings as inherently nasty, evil. In other words, some people are just born to be bullies the way some people are born with green eyes. That's just the way that it is. They can't help it. It's in their DNA. Some people are born to be more mean than other people. Then there's the answer on the other side, and it says, you know what? We're really not born to be mean or nice. Our education seems to some degree to kind of predetermine the way that we act and interact with others. Now, over our time together, we will hear from lots and lots of voices about this dialectic, I'm going to use that term now, dialectic, that is to say this tension, this back and forth pull. The word dialectic often used by the great philosopher Plato, it is to say a tension between opposite poles. The term itself dialectic will become very popular by the great German philosopher Hegel, who will say, in the history of thought, You've always got these things that look kind of like this. You have what he called a thesis. We'll allow A to represent the thesis. And then you have its opposite. We'll call that B. This is our thesis. And if this is our thesis, this is our antithesis, or sometimes said the antithesis. And they're kind of always warring or fighting against each other. And out of that antithesis will derive what he called a C, which is a what? Does anybody know their Hegelian philosophy? What do we call this? You're right, Mr. Scott. Well done. This is the C synthesis, right? So this is the synthesis of the two opposites that come together. Okay. Now Martin Luther King Jr., who you'll be writing on, wrote a famous speech in, when he made, in which he made the following observation. He said, oppressed peoples respond to oppression in three characteristic ways. He, of course, knew his Hegel well. He said, the first response to oppression, I walk up to Mr. Scott and I whack, will not do this. And I whack him. I'm oppressing him in some way. MLK actually says there's three ways for Scoder to respond to me. Now, that kind of shocks some of you to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Somebody walks up to me and slaps me across the face. They ain't but one way to respond. Let's go ahead and say it out loud. MLK's first response is to hit back. Right. Hit back. Okay. That's one response. One response is just smack back, right? An eye for an eye, this kind of thing. King will point out, though, that an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind, commenting, of course, borrowing uh, from the great Gandhi uh, philosophy, right? Eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. He says violence isn't the way. It doesn't work very well. A second response to oppression is what he calls acquiescence. You just sit there and take it over and over again. Just keep getting hit. So Skoda just sits there and says, you know what? <sighs> I guess I just have to sit here and let you whack on me some more. Sure, why not? Hit me some more. Fine, fine. That's called acquiescence. Martin Luther King Jr. says in his famous essay, but that's immoral. And here's why. If Skoda lets me just continue to whack on him, Skoda is not thinking about me. Now, I know this sounds totally counterintuitive, but listen to the genius of King. He says, if Skoda lets me just sit here and whack on him, over time, I'm actually going to begin to believe that he deserves it. I'm actually going to believe I'm better than him. And King will say, Skoda has a moral duty to take care of me, the guy that's whacking on him. And if I let him continue, if he lets me continue to whack on him, I'm going to begin to think I'm actually better than him. 
and he deserves this kind of uh, treatment. And to that degree, King says, Skoda isn't taking care of me. He says, we're all our brother's keepers and sister's keepers. And if uh, you allow a bully to continue to be a bully, you're not loving the bully, taking care of the bully. What a strange argument. And yet it's kind of intuitive if you'll think about it, right? Do you, does Skoda need to take care of me? He needs to take care of all people. Skoda would say, yeah, I, I believe that. So even the guy that's smacking on somebody? Yeah. Even, even the bully? Well, yeah, I guess so. So that means you've got to take care of the bully by standing up to the bully. So notice on my whiteboard here, Hegel's observation. On the one hand, we can have what we call acquiescence. On the other, we can have violence. But King will say about both of these views, they're not, they're not really very good moral views. Violence, hitting back is not a good view. Sitting there, taking it, not a good view. But he says there's a third way, and he calls it non-violent resistance. <clears throat> this will become foundational in American thought, non-violent resistance. And he says this is an idea that borrows some from the idea of acquiescence, you shouldn't hit back. And some, from the idea of violence, you should fight back. And you bring the two together. One example of this, of course, are the classic sit-ins of the civil rights movement, right? Where you sit in, for example, a, at a counter where blacks are not allowed to eat with white people. But instead, whites and blacks come in together and sit at this counter and then get hit on. Or the famous Memphis strike where all of the garbage collectors collectively said, we're not going to pick up garbage anymore. And over a period of two weeks in the middle of summer in Memphis, the, the trash starts piling up. And people start saying, we, we got to do something about this. This is terrible, allowing for political discourse to then take place. In conclusion, it seems to me, as we think now in our final moments about this topic, you have to make some decision about what your views are on this topic, right? Do you think bullies are bullies because they're born to be bullies, or are they bullies because of their poor education? Do you believe that a bully can be changed in some way? Once a bully, always a bully? Or can a bully be changed in some way? Do you believe bullies should be stood up to but without necessarily fighting back an eye for an eye, if you will. What is the best way to respond? Let's point out, though, in conclusion, that Eli Weissel will say something really profoundly important. If you allow a bully to be a bully and don't fight back, that is to say, let Nazis kill Jews and don't do anything, you are complicitous. Like the student who put, reported, I sat every day at lunch and watched my buddies pick on this freshman. I never did it, but I watched them do it. But I never said anything because I didn't want them to pick on me. So I just kind of sat there and let it happen. Eli Weissel is telling me I'm as guilty as the guys who picked on the freshman. And I say, no, Eli Weissel says you're more guilty. Because the bully might not realize, remember back to my example of hitting Skoda over and over, the bully might not realize anymore that the bully is being a bully. But you recognized what was happening was bad, and you didn't do anything about it. You're actually more guilty for Eli Weissel. You have a moral obligation to stand up and say, knock it off. Even if there's some fear they might bully you, to say, Knock it off. It's not a good thing. Don't, don't do it. Why do you think it's so hard to do that? What is it so hard to stand up in the face of oppression and to say, stop? Why is that hard, do you think? It's the F word, isn't it? Not that F word. A different F word, right? It's fear, isn't it? You bet it is. It's fear. And in fact, our student, my student said this. I was really afraid they would like turn on me. It's much better if they were bugging, if they were picking on someone else. We're all familiar with middle school drama in this regards, right? Just make sure they're not picking on me. As long as they're picking on someone else, it's all fine. It's all okay. Well, there you go. An introduction to issues of oppression and power. And we'll have much more to say. And